everybody. Good morning uh, from uh, uh, Washington and good afternoon from Paris, where I am presently. My name is Jean Bertrand Mott. I'm the head of the Fragility Crisis and Conflict Department, and I'm very happy to uh, uh, be introducing this uh, panel and to be your moderator also for this panel. We call uh, Auto Operational as uh, Prevention in the Gulf of Guinea. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, a few colleagues that I'm going to introduce for this uh, hour-long uh, panel. Uh, please uh, welcome uh, Mrs. Uh, Finda Koroma, who is uh, Vice President of uh, ECOWAS. Thanks a lot, uh, Mrs. Koroma, for being with us. I'm delighted to, to have uh, Nico Munger with us from uh, uh, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Germany, the Auswärtige Samt. Uh, Mrs. Menger is Policy and Strategic Partnership uh, uh, Team Leader. Uh, thanks a lot for being here too. And uh, thanks a lot, Mathieu. Mathieu Disco, who is uh, from the Agence Française de Développement also. Joining us from uh, Abidjan is uh, a Director of the Gulf of Guinea Regional Office. So thanks uh, for the three of you to be uh, joining us uh, for this live session about uh, prevention in the uh, Gulf of Guinea. Uh, just to uh, uh, give you a quick uh, outlook of our session today, I'm going to present very quickly um, the um, early warning uh, system we put in place at the Agence Française de Développement. Then it's going to be uh, followed by a presentation by Mathieu, another short presentation by Mrs. Coroma, and to be concluded by uh, Mrs. Menger. And then we'll take uh, your question that I think you can post online and that I can read uh, to our panelists and have a few uh, uh, Q&A sessions to, to get it lively. So if it's all right, I'm going to start with the first segment of our session today, just to explain a little bit uh, what we put in place at Agence Française de Développement regarding regional early warning system. Uh, we focus it on anticipating socio-political crisis and conflict, uh, it started basically in November 2020 with three monitoring cycles, at the end of which a report was uh, issued. The tool encompasses six countries uh, of the Gulf of Guinea, uh, Benin, Ivory Coast, uh, Guinea, Ghana, parts of Nigeria and Togo, to monitor the evolution of short-term factor of fragility in light of social dynamics of development, fragility and peace in the area. Um, this monitoring system combines different technologies. Uh, we have an early warning tool with regional, national, and local analysis. We have a qualitative and a quantitative analysis uh, basis tool. And we have a multidimensional approach adapted to connect development needs with fragility and crisis issues. Uh, this system is based on two complementary uh, contractors. The first one is Control Risk, uh, in charge of field data collection and coordination. Uh, we have on the ground with Control Risk 60 local observers in the Gulf of Guinea countries. Uh, Control Risk and the 60 local observers, they collect field data in the IFD project location and what we assume will be a high risk areas. And every two weeks, uh, field observer or upload information on the platform, the platform being um, run and implemented by Bagboka, the second contractor who is in charge of the open source data collection via machinery platform management that contains all collected data and risk analysis, including triangulation of data. Based on this uh, two uh, complementary contractors work, uh, we based it with two deliverables, two main ones. One is an analytical monitoring platform, which uh, had all the monitoring data from the field and from open sources. It provides a very um, graphic visualization of the data through maps and graphs, of course. And the platform uh, is updated every two weeks or so. Then, uh, from all this data on the platform, uh, we get a monitoring report uh, that we've decided to publish every six months to get enough uh, interesting data from the field and from the open source collection. It includes a complete mapping of analysis and risk areas for the six countries. It is based on field data collection, open sources. Also, we have graph and visual, re visual representation to better understand the dynamics of risk, uh, both at the local country and even at the regional level of the Gulf of Guinea. 
Um, this kind of uh, tool and deliverables uh, were aiming at the very beginning of uh, the implementation to strengthen what we call the 3D dialogue. The 3D dialogue is a bit similar to what uh, the United States know uh, in foreign policy. It's based on diplomacy, uh, defense, and development. So basically, Agence Française de Développement created a tool and is running a tool on the development side, but to provide uh, a platform and a uh, based off uh, exchanges with our colleagues from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and with the colleagues of the Ministry of uh, Defense. It allows us over the past year, in 21 mainly, to develop a unique dialogue in conflict prevention in the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, we had the, the promotion of joint diagnosis to foster a coherent and convergent action, which is always difficult when you have three different bodies uh, which has in charge of uh, the same strategy. So it was a very strong tool to, to put all together around the table and to exchange on uh, prevention of conflict in the Gulf of Guinea. Um, for us at l'Agence Française de Développement, the regional uh, early warning system uh, supports also the, the operationalization of the prevention agenda. Um, and I'm going to pass for that aspect the uh, floor to Mathieu, who is uh, once again, our regional director for the area, and is going to explain uh, to you how it works with uh, operationalization of prevention. Mathieu? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean Bertrand, and uh, hello to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, myself, I'm based in Abidjan, and uh, as, mentioned by, as mentioned by Jean Bertrand, I'm in charge of a large region uh, called Gulf of Guinea, uh, covering eight countries from Nigeria to Guinea Conakry, all these coastal countries, uh, which are, I would say, beyond the uh, Sahel crisis uh, crescent, as we, we may call it. And um, a, a few years ago, when we uh, uh, worked on our strategy, we, we were asking uh, how to, to deal with this, uh, this uh, threat. Uh, and and uh, to, to be clear, we, when we wrote our strategy, uh, it, it, it was very clear for us that the strategy of Gulf of Guinea couldn't be written uh, without uh, a link with the situation in Sahel which is opportunity uh, driven, but also threat driven. And uh, based on that, uh, we, 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 we came very clearly to the conclusion that we, uh, we have to, to work on this prevention, prevention uh, aspect of our work. Um, to be also very clear, it was very new for uh, Agence Française de Développement. Uh, every year we, uh, we commit around 1 billion euro new projects. And um, I would say they, are, they, were, they were usually um, prepared under a traditional way of uh, doing, I would say uh, a donor, uh, a traditional way of doing. So that means uh, mainly uh, national uh, design projects and um, also, um, I would say, uh, with a, a very, uh, uh, very traditional project owner. That means mainly uh, national authorities, state authorities. And um, it, it was also a, a, an area where we, we had to work to see if uh, regarding uh, prevention, this type of um, uh, way of doing uh, is adapted. And um, the, in, in this respect, the only warning system was very key for us to change our, our way of doing. Uh, first of all, because it provides uh, non-national data, and it provides uh, also 
uh, not only technical uh, data. Uh, so that's very important for our um, team leader to get uh, information beyond their technicalities. Uh, so that means uh, uh, sociological, uh, anthropological, um, um, even religious, political um, data. Um, and when I say data, I mean uh, data with very precise local information, which is also something very new, because we were uh, very often when we design project and when we implement project at a larger scale and uh, uh, with the prevention agenda, we have to go uh, more deeply into the, um, uh, the, the, the local uh, details uh, to make sure that we provide the, the right solution. So that's something very new with the early uh, warning system. And um, as well, uh, the early warning system provides dynamic data and dynamic uh, information. Uh, of course, we, we had this, um, I would say, risk uh, assessment, regional risk assessment, but they are more static and um, they're not uh, adapted to uh, uh, the prevention agenda. So in this regard, the early warning system was very adapted because of this dynamic, as mentioned by Jean, uh, Jean Bertrand, there is a, a six months um, renewal and uh, also some uh, very specific uh, uh, analysis uh, on, on thematic issues, depending on the, uh, on, on the news or on the demand. So I think it's uh, also something very important uh, for us to, uh, to, to, to build new projects. Uh, then uh, it's also, uh, I think, very important, this type of approach, because it can help us mainstream uh, the, um, I would say, the prevention agenda in all our pipeline. Um, it's not we have to do uh, one project uh, uh, which will deal with prevention, but we have to make sure that we mainstream prevention in all our um, a pipeline in all our activity. And in this regard, this type of instruments is very key because uh, uh, we, we can um, have, a, a, I would say, user-friendly information, large-scale information, and, and make sure that we don't uh, miss um, the, 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 the goal uh, regarding this uh, prevention agenda. So uh, just to to say that, uh, of course, uh, we, we, we think about uh, uh, how to, to connect with um, Sahel uh, also in, uh, with regard to this uh, early warning system and uh, to make sure that um, uh, the dynamics we, uh, we praise in this type of instruments uh, can be also caught in, um, in Sahel and uh, and, and that we can have a consolidating, consolidated information to make sure that we uh, better catch the, um, uh, the, the evolution and, and have a, a better capacity to, to work. So thank you very much. I will uh, stop here. Double uh, mic to open. Then you can hear me. Thanks a lot, Mathieu, for this uh, early uh, look into um, the operation of the early warning system tool. I'm going to pass. Uh, so to Mrs. Koroma, uh, Vice President of the ECOWAS Commission. Thanks again for being here. Ms. Mrs. Koroma, you could, um, of course, uh, present what the ECOWAS was working on with early system warning, but I'm sure um, what Mathieu said about uh, national institution will echo your, your presentation also as being uh, part of the ECOWAS system. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. As you all know, ECOWAS does have an early warning system, which was established in 2001 to monitor regional peace and security indicators for threats to peace and security in the region. But most important, it was designed to alert the president of the ECOWAS Commission so that in his interaction with uh, ministers and heads of states, he would be able to at least lay the issues on the table and frame the questions. Now, 
with all humility, it's been seen as one of the most successful systems um, because we learned a lot from uh, interventions, as you're aware, the war in Liberia and Guinea with ECOMOG. We learned vital lessons that were put in the system, but also we've had a lot of experience with human security. Um, I believe that the tools we use are very relevant and well thought out, and this has led to the success. One comparative advantage we do have is our relationship of proximity with civil society organizations, and of course, the decentralization of early warning centers now in the member states. ECOWAS has 15 member states, as some of you may know. Um, first of all, we established a, a memorandum of, of understanding with ONEP, the West African Network for Peace Building, and they have been supporting us at the regional level and now also at the member state level with information gathering and analysis. And all of this is put in a regional system called ECHO-1. ECHO-1 issues daily highlights, um, which is sent to all member states, especially the embassies in Abuja. But everybody can go online and see our ECHO-1 um, updates. But also the ECHO-1 system generates thematic uh, reports. Uh, as you know, our early warning system is based on five thematic areas, crime and criminality, security and terrorism, pandemics and, and health. We also have agriculture and the environment and then governance, human rights, and we also have embedded gender into that. The second advantage, as I said, is that we're opening national early warning centers. And the advantage of this is that it gives the government national ownership I will come to some of the risks we saw with that, uh, but we decided to open up national centers in the uh, member states. At present, we have 10. We had the first five that were funded by the US government. Uh, these were Burkina Faso, um, La Côte d'Ivoire, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, and Mali. And now the EU has come in through the African Union, the African uh, Peace and Security Architecture, but also through GIZ, the German government has also made a contribution under the ECOWAS Peace and Security Architecture to open up the 10 remaining member states. So at present, we're on the verge of launching in the Gambia. We've launched in Sierra Leone. Guinea is also on the verge of being launched. We've launched in Ghana and just recently in Niger. The other ones that are in the pipeline, I can comfortably say, is Republic of Benin and Nigeria. And we're waiting the uh, governments of Senegal, Togo, and Cabo Verde to uh, sign MOUs with us. Now, let me talk about some of the potential actions and solutions that we have seen. One of the gaps we see is the, 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 the systematic link between alerts and response is not as it should be. Because member states pride themselves in doing the responses. So our role as ECOWAS is to give the alerts out to these threats, but because of sovereignty issues and of course national security issues, the governments always say that the response should come from them. The challenge we have is that the, um, we do not have a system to monitor very efficiently the responses based on alerts that are given, but we will come to that um, at a later stage. One way we uh, saw to bridge this gap was to transfer the early warning system from political affairs, peace and security to the office of the vice president. The advantage of that is that because the president of the Air Force Commission is very busy with um, external work, as VP, I'm able to get in touch with him very quickly to table threats to peace and security based on reports that we get from ECHO-1, but also from the member states. And then we've also set up a statutory board in the member states so that early warning centers are being supervised by the prime ministers or vice presidents in our member states. So as vice president, I and the director of early warning do attend the statutory board meetings. We should do it a little bit more frequently, but the last two years has seen ECHO us under pressure with the multiple coup d'etats that are happening. So in terms of that gap, you know, we, we really believe that, you know, preventive um, uh, diplomacy mechanisms could have played a stronger role in thwarting some of these threats. 
Let me now turn to um, the issue of national interests and sovereignty. You see that very often, but even within the, the, the member states themselves, national security officers are not very often uh, open to sharing confidential data with early warning um, staff in the national centers. To bridge that gap, we have pushed for member states to recruit staff with intelligence experience. When you're one of them, it's more easy to get them to check a confidential source, even though we only deal with you know, secondary source, open data. But there comes a time when you have to also look at you know, um, security data. So we're finding now that because in each early warning office, there is at least one or two officers that come from the national intelligence system, they've been able to bridge that gap and we see stronger collaboration. In terms of the methodology, um, as I said, we use open source. We have 77 monitors, field monitors in the member states. Some member states have about seven or eight. Um, the challenge I see there though, is that uh, not all the field monitors have expertise in some of the technical areas. Uh, climate change is one area where ECOWAS lacks the expertise. So we, we pull on partnerships with um, specialized agencies to deal with the human security uh, challenges or transnational dimensions that would come from there. I must admit that. We have also started pushing the national centers to work collaboratively uh, on cross-border issues like the pandemic. When we had the COVID pandemic, every national center had to be online with each other to share information, obviously because the pandemic had a cross-border element in it. We're seeing that also with the Sahel because of terrorism. Quite recently, we launched a study with ELVA, a Dutch NGO with funding from the Dutch government on the spillover effects of uh, terrorism onto the coastal states. There again, we've seen the, the national centers working together uh, to deal with that. ECOWAS enjoys a very strong collaboration with the United Nations office in West Africa and the Sahel. And we have seen, of course, the president of the ECOWAS Commission undertaking joint missions. We've seen that in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger as we deal with the uh, coup d'etats that uh, seem to have been featuring. Uh, we also undertake joint mediation missions with them. And we also collaborate with the UN mission MINUSMA in, in Mali. On the continental front, we have a very strong relationship with the AU, the African Union. We are part of the technical meetings with regional economic um, communities where, you know, ECOWAS staff meet twice a year. And, uh, we, and the ECOWAS system itself, the early warning system was inspired, you know, by the AU system. Ambassador Bancoli, the new uh, Commissioner for Political Affairs, uh, Peace and Security, is going to be introducing a dialogue series. And I think with that, we would be able to, to even have stronger collaboration with the AU on that. Um, we also have, of course, international partners, as I said, the US State Department, USAID, uh, have been giving technical info, um, training. They worked with us in developing the country risk and vulnerability studies. Um, which actually shows risks and vulnerabilities in each of our member states. We also have a regional uh, risk and vulnerability study. Right now we're working on the Human Security Index with uh, the Fund for Peace, with funding from um, USAID. Uh, on the German side, as I said, BMZ has set up uh, the ECOWAS Fund for Stabilization in fragile regions and what we've done with that, and I'm really grateful to Germany for that, even though ECOWAS itself commits money on an annual basis from its community levy, it is also premised on the early warning system. Before we go in to begin to design civilization programs, they are guided by reports from ECHO1 and also the national reports that come from the national early warning system. So you'd see that now we're in Guinea-Bissau, we're in the Gambia as well with the Fund for Stabilization, we're moving on to Niger. Mali has been put on hold because Mali is under suspension, but we are still continuing work in preparing Mali for stabilization. And I think eventually we'd have to look at Burkina Faso and in Guinea as well. Um, one or two other issues I wanted to, to say is that, you know, every actor and every institution has its own agenda. 
But we've realized that we have to have a coordinated approach when we deal with terrorism in particular. And I think, you know, we want to run the risk of, we do not want to run the risk of overlapping uh, security mandates. And this is why we work with the political affairs, peace and security division in, in ECOWAS that has the mandate for that. Um, and we're able to do elections observations with them. We have an election observation tool that early warning introduced that is used by the elections observation monitors. We are also working on a pandemic tool, although I think we need um, more help on that uh, in that area. And we want to actually get our, our, our staff the field monitors and um, even the GIS uh, experts in national centers to begin to use artificial intelligence to back up, you know, all the graphs that, that we're able to generate um, um, through systems. One missing element, and that I want to admit is, you know, the, the absence of a monitoring evaluation framework. As I said, this lies at the heart of sustainability of the system. We're going to be looking at that closely to see how we can actually monitor responses to some of these alerts. Um, and I want to say that for the first time, um, ECOWAS would be hosting a meeting of all vice presidents and prime ministers who are on statutory boards, because we believe that you know joint collaboration with them, uh, which would also trigger joint co collaboration with national security advisors would actually go a long way to strengthening um, the sustainability. So once again, you know, it's, it's an interesting system. Country buying, as I said, has been woven through the establishment of these national centers. So we hope that um, in a few years, we would have an even stronger story to tell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Kuruma, for this broad uh, presentation of the early warning uh, system of ECOWAS. I'm going to give the floor to uh, Nicole Manger from Mars Vasigal Um Thanks for joining us. Uh, you're going to present to us a preview, and I guess uh, it will have some echoes from uh, what uh, Madam Kuruma just uh, mentioned for ECOWAS. <clears throat> Yes, uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much also for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure. Um, so uh, yes, I uh, present uh, the preview platform uh, in the German Foreign uh, Ministry. So uh, basically what preview is, um, it's the crisis early warning uh, unit uh, at our ministry. We have uh, one large quantitative uh, platform or team that focuses on anything from uh, utilizing artificial intelligence um, for predictive uh, models, um, but also uh, creating interactive dashboards uh, for uh, practitioners at the ministry to use or um, ad hoc spontaneous uh, fixed maps at the highest level to be used. Um, but also a whole uh, team working on qualitative uh, analyses. So writing uh, conflict analyses, uh, strategic foresight assessments, and writing uh, integrated country reports. Um, as such, Preview as a whole team is responsible for um, coordinating the interministerial formal early warning process of Germany. So what this is, and I think that's really, uh, really, really important for us to coordinate uh, the different segments of early warning and early action specifically. So um, it is a process that brings together the German foreign ministry, but also the defense ministry, the Ministry on Development uh, Cooperation, BMZ, uh, and the Ministry on uh, Economic Cooperation, and then finally also the Chancellor's Office. And this is like a real whole, whole of government approach uh, to early warning and early action. Um, it is important because our uh, humanitarian development, uh, peace and security projects are so scattered across the different ministries. So we need this formal process to come together and develop a comprehensive strategy. Um, just some words on how it works. Uh, usually we would generate uh, a short list of uh, countries at risk uh, using preview uh, predictive models. Um, and then, of course, taking into, into consideration uh, uh, German political interests uh, in specific regions, um, but also our capacities, like our leverage uh, in specific regions, we would make a decision on which country or which region to uh, analyze in depth. And then we would bring in the delegations, the missions abroad, the different ministries to really create an assessment, a comprehensive assessment um, of the conflict drivers, and then also develop uh, policy recommendations. 
The bad thing is it stops there. As soon as we have the policy recommendations, um, the implementation uh, of the different projects, be it humanitarian projects, development projects, or uh, stabilization uh, projects, including SSR projects, then is back in the hands of the different ministries and different sections. And also, as Madame Koroma said, we also lack a, a comprehensive evaluation uh, system and process. So, but at least we have this formalized process until we have the policy recommendations. Um, so that's part one. Um, this is very ge uh, general on uh, like the formal process in Germany. We have carried out a lot of analyses, including also Burkina Faso and the spillover effects uh, from uh, Central Sahelian uh, countries to uh, the Gulf of Guinea um, and a lot of different country analyses. However, we have never done like a whole comprehensive whole of government assessment on the Gulf of Guinea itself. However, what we have done now on the preview side, um, we have a regional conflict monitor. Um, and we started with the Lake Chad Basin last year, and this was a really successful tool and there was high demand. So we now expanded it to the Gulf of Guinea. And basically what this does is um, it brings together uh, data on uh, Germany's project presence in the region. So um, across the HDP nexus, so our humanitarian uh, project presence, the um, peace and security, so stabilization projects, SSR projects, and also the development projects. And we locate those um, at very high resolution. So really at the subnational, provincial level. Um, and then what we do is we have our, um, the results of our prediction model also at subnational uh, level. Um, and show where we anticipate conflicts to arise or escalation to arise. And basically, we try to answer the question, are we um, present in the right location with our projects or should we maybe tailor or adapt our capacities, maybe relocate, but also maybe scale up in specific, uh, you know, like with specific projects um, or scale down with others. This is really important uh, tool for um, like, as I said, like we stuck with the formalized process with the policy recommendations, but when it comes to implementation, we have no coordination mechanism. But this tool provides a platform to really, uh, how can I say, like mainstream data we have from the different ministries on the different HDP uh, working streams and coordinate our projects better. Um, now I come to the limitation, and this is basically one of the first challenges that I see. Um, so it is of most interest to our practitioners and policymakers here in the uh, foreign ministry, but also in different ministries, not only where our projects are located, but where our partners are, of course. Um, and this is so critical because especially in with such complex uh, spillover dynamics, uh, like between the Sahelian countries and uh, the Gulf of Guinea countries, um, for example, with uh, violent ex extremism spreading across from Burkina Faso um, into borderlands or displacement uh, in, in, in borderland regions. Um, I think there's really this whole of government approach needed um, across the HP nexus, but then really coordinating this with our partners and local stakeholders, because the least thing we want to do is run counter uh, to what local uh, actors are doing and what our partners are doing. So for us, it's, it's critical to know where partners are. And we only know this for the humanitarian projects and the development projects for the whole field of stabilization. So the whole peace and security field, because it is so sensitive, we don't know. But that's why in our assessment, it would be really helpful to have um, might be just with the closest partners, but have an international data exchange and a joint, um, a joint analysis tool uh, to really provide this platform for joint analysis and coordination. Um, some of the other limits are of more political and financial nature. Um, so first, maybe uh, the political side. So really, it's the question of mobilizing uh, for support, for prevention, rather than reaction. And I think it's very, so just observing it internally, it is very difficult um, because uh, usually people are hesitant to provide resources, large scale resources for something that is yet to happen. Sometimes they don't even know if it is at all to happen. And we tell them, so previous says, okay, we see it in our prediction models. Um, but then there's also this hesitancy to believe what the prediction models are saying or what the evidence is saying, what the data is saying. So because it is something that is yet to happen. And so I think this is a general problem for prevention. Um, but I think we could 
um, overcome this by showing through effective evaluation mechanisms the success um, of preventive measures and how it also reduces costs and saves lives and helps people in those in those affected regions. So evaluation, I think, is a critical component here as well um, to to expand on. Um, maybe another point on financing. Uh, so. I think so. Germany is a, is a is very proactive in anticipatory humanitarian action, and there the whole system of forecast-based financing works very fast and almost automated. So you would have like a natural uh, hazard, and then immediately resources are set free and could be utilized. Of course, for peace and security, this is not yet not so easy to to transfer because first um, the causal links between uh, you know, like predicting a violent conflict is not as easy as predicting a natural hazard, but of course, um, humanitarian action is apolitical in nature and, and uh, stabilization efforts are not. So of course, there's this whole political um, uh, coordination process involved, but that makes it very uh, difficult to provide resources very fast to those regions they needed immediately. Um, I think I will stop here and uh, maybe leave other points uh, for, for the discussion then. Thanks a lot, Nico. It was really, uh, very clear. Um, I would just like at this stage to mention to our audience that they could uh, ask their question in the uh, uh, Google Doc. I think uh, the links were uh, provided, so don't hesitate to uh, ask questions to our panelists and I will, uh, I will read them to them. Um, but meanwhile, I'm going to um, follow up on some of the things you mentioned uh, during your, your free presentation. Um, the, the first one, maybe for you, Mathieu, uh, from, from Abidjan perspective and as uh, the, the head of the regional office uh, for a development agency. Um, Madame Koroma mentioned the self-driven agenda of the actors, of course, different ministry, different actors, and the need to coordinate approaches. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about this from your perspective in Abidjan with all the different uh, uh, actors in the French team and also with your partners uh, in Ivory Coast. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Jean-Bertrand. Um, I would say it's, um, yeah, as you mentioned, there are different levels for a bilateral agency like uh, Agence Française de Développement. Uh, there is, first of all, this, um, this uh, French, uh, uh, French coordination between different type of actors, uh, uh, including development uh, bodies like Agence Française de Développement, uh, but also uh, diplomacy, French uh, diplomats, uh, embassies in the region, and um, defense in some cases. And uh, even in a region like Gulf of Guinea, which is not, I would say, a conflict area, as you, as you know, this defense dimension is present uh, for France, but for other bilateral uh, uh, actors, uh, um, because of their, uh, the, the prevention um, uh, is also uh, involving uh, security uh, specialists and, uh, and, and line ministries. So um, there is an approach, of course, everybody has its own uh, uh, channel, um, but uh, there is a need to um, to exchange on the diagnosis. And in this uh, uh, regard, early warning system is very useful because it provides, I would say, neutral information, which is uh, very useful for all the actors and uh, which may provide uh, uh, information. Uh, and for a bilateral um, actor like France, it's uh, of course very important to understand what should be first, what should be coordinated on the ground at, in some cases and um, what should be avoided in, in other cases. So uh, I think it's very, uh, very important. Of course, the donor coordination um, aspect is also uh, very key, uh, especially in Gulf of Guinea. And um, uh, the, the regional uh, dimension um, 
managed by ECOWAS is um, is very um, very key, uh, uh, especially because also it's uh, as you mentioned, uh, I would say a south driven uh, mechanism, and um, in this case, it's uh, it's there is this ownership aspect which is uh, it's, which is very key, and we uh, it's important to rely on. But there is also uh, I would say the, the old donor community uh, and, um, and the, like mentioned by Nicole, uh, uh, of course, the um, bilateral um, uh, actors have their own system. And I think we are just at the beginning of uh, the exchange of uh, information in this regard. Um, I was very interested in all your presentation because uh, I was not aware of all the dimensions, so I think we we should uh, uh, we should coordinate uh, uh, better in this regard and see how we can uh, uh, work together, reduce uh, the cost of uh, um, transaction, and um, yeah, at least exchange information to make sure we we can have better uh, diagnostics. Thank you, Robert. -Tron. Thanks a lot, uh, Mathieu. Um, you, um, the, the three of you mentioned the, the spillover effect from uh, from sale and the need to work on uh, counter extremism. Um, and um, Madame Coroma, this question is probably more for you. You mentioned also the limitation, the barrier of national sovereignty in your in your expose. Uh, or, or can you, or, or could you, or did you actually, because uh, you, you mentioned it, you, you did engage with your um, Sahelian uh, counterparts, or, or, or did you manage to, to work on this very uh, uh, sovereignty issues of spillover effect from Sahel to the Gulf of Guinea and the application in terms of prevention, of course, uh, for them? Well, as I said, well, two things in terms of national sovereignty issues. Many countries do not want to discuss their country risk and vulnerability assessments. They, they guard that and it is something we really need to talk about because when you talk about the spillover effects of terrorism, you know, to coastal countries, you realize that if they do not share the data, even at the early warning uh, centers amongst themselves in terms of the Sahelian and the uh, Gulf of uh, Guinea countries, it's going to be a problem. This study was done with ECOS and ONEF and ELVA, which is a Dutch NGO, and they did a lot of field assessments. It's been launched by ECOS, and uh, we want to now take it officially to our Council of uh, Ministers because the findings of what it predicted, that the north of Burkina Faso, the north of Togo, La Côte d'Ivoire, Bahad Bassam, would be hit, we see happening, including the north of Ghana. If you see in the last six weeks, you know, terrorist attacks have occurred in these areas. And I think the member states are, are taking this more seriously now. I see that the directors of the National Early Warning Centers are talking to each other. And as I said, because some of them come from the intelligence uh, uh, area, they're able to talk to each other through their national security um, advisors. But if you permit me, I really also want to talk about what, you know, the, the colleague from AFD just said. On the donor side, you need to also at least find a way of working with us and helping us uh, sharpen our conflict analysis um, methodologies or even just validate some of our findings. Because you, your countries also have significant interest in our member states. And it is something we have called for quite often. You know, I did not know if they had um, uh, an early warning system. I have tried to work with the German system and the UK system. And we've also reached out to WFP and UNDP. But that collaboration is not as forthcoming as we expect it to be. I hope that after this meeting, I would be able to send emails to you to find ways in which um, we would be able to, to look at that collaboration more seriously. But yes, you know, uh, from a country risk and vulnerability point of view, the countries have started talking to each other. 
I think eventually they would get over the sovereignty issue because it, it actually stops ECOWAS from being a supranational entity because very often the, the, the line is drawn and they tell us that national security is a sovereign issue and we have to leave it with them. But I think if we move on to an m &E system where we actually have a dashboard to monitor the, the responses to the alerts that are being um, churned out, not only from the regional system, but also from the national centers, we would be able to, to get over you know, the turf wars a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Kroma, and your plea uh, has been heard. Of course, we'll, we'll be in touch and uh, we'll, uh, we'll work further. As Mathieu said, uh, we have to, to better coordinate uh, in, in, in most ways. Um, Nicole had a question, but you, you, you took a hint in your presentation about uh, the difficulty to uh, mobilize uh, internally in your own German system, your colleagues on uh, conflict prevention issues. Uh, we, of course, from Agence Française de Développement, we could also uh, um, have some say about this, but I was uh, going to ask you, how did you overcome these difficulties? And uh, do you have some lessons learned uh, to share with the audience about the way to overpass this difficulty to mobilize in prevention instead of always reacting to uh, events and uh, uh, self-driven agendas? Um, yes, uh, thanks Thanks for this question. Uh, I think it's an ongoing effort uh, on our side. So I think when we started first uh, about like uh, five, four to five years ago with the former early warning process, there was really a huge hesitancy. So people, especially at the higher level, at the state secretary level or below at the uh, director general level, they only uh, had a desire to do this process once a year. Uh, so then um, as this, uh, you know, started to, to work successfully, or you know, uh, things started to move. We are now at a uh, at a time speed of four analyses per year. So I think there is growing acceptance of this process and also growing acceptance um, of the need for doing uh, conflict early warning and uh, and prevent taking preventive measures and also increasing uh, acceptance for providing financial resources in a preventive manner than rather than a reactive uh, manner. Um, however, I think there is still. Um, so this, um, this, this acceptance for evidence-based data-driven input um, is still, uh, it, well, I mean, I, I could just say like we could strengthen it uh, at this point. So what we have, for example, here is that, as I said, like we, uh, we give this preview-based uh, predictive uh, modeling input at the beginning. It's very similar to what the e, uh, EAS is doing in the EU context. So they also have um, a quantitative input in the beginning. They do a short list or a long list in their case. And then uh, based on, on interests um, of, of that specific institution and also so, uh, leverage and uh, capacities uh, to, to deal with a specific region, you would select uh, one, one country for analysis. But then in our case, after this quantitative data-driven evidence-based input, uh, there's no involvement of us um, except for coordinating the whole process. So something like this um, monitoring tool um, that we are using, I think could be very well used later on uh, to also develop the policy recommendations, um, develop, uh, you know, uh, basically plan and program these specific specific projects uh, that we support and also coordinate better with our partners uh, and specifically also uh, local actors in the regions. Um, but this is, so this is, uh, I think, really an area where, where we could um, Im improve. And this would also, then I think, um, if we show more evidence and more data, I think this would also show decision makers that we need to take action because the signs, the early warning signs are really showing that, uh, that, the, that the situation is escalating or deteriorating. Um, and then finally, I think what, what could also help mobilize a support, and I would like to pick up what Madame Koroma said, is really um, putting more emphasis on evaluation of uh, the whole prevention uh, mechanism. So really evaluating in a systematic way um, First, the early warning signs. Are our predictions correct? Uh, did we, you know, did we did we make the right predictions uh, and, and really see that in retrospect? But really also monitoring and evaluating the whole process from the knowledge part, generating early warning signals to finally um, 
planning and implementing uh, preventive uh, operations or, or measures um, in, in specific contexts and really seeing was that successful, what we have been doing. Um, and if it was successful, I think that would be a great convincing argument uh, to show um, you know, the, the positive benefits, but also the cost savings of taking preventive actions rather than reactive actions. Um, so I think it really centers around uh, strengthening evidence-based policymaking, strengthening evaluation mechanisms, um, and really strengthening this cross-ministerial, cross but also international collaboration um, on, on prevention. Thanks a lot, uh, Nicole, for this uh, clear answer. Um, we still have nine minutes left on my watch and still uh, get no question from the audience. No, I don't see any questions. So, um, Mathieu, I just wanted to know if you had something uh, to react to this, um, what Nicole just said about uh, mainstreaming and maybe just to give a, one or two examples of projects that were impacted by prevention and the way we arbitrate between reaction and prevention in the Gulf of Guinea. Yeah, thank you. Um, th thank you very much. Yeah, the way we the way we we manage it is um, uh, we have two two different ways to to make this new type of project regarding uh, uh, prevention. Um, first of all, we still have um, I would say sectorial entry points because as a development banks, we used to work through. Uh, infrastructure, energy, and um, it's still something we we have to do, uh, especially because uh, when we work on the, um, the analysis, we see that uh, one of the, uh, the causes of these vulnerabilities is the the lack of access to uh, basic services in uh, in in the, the north of Gulf of Guinea and the inequalities. Uh, regarding uh, access to uh, basic services. So, I mean, we're still very active in providing um, schools, health services, uh, energy, roads, uh, and try to be more focused in the north of the region. Um, of course, it's not our decision. There is a demand from the country. So that's something we, we can feel, uh, and it has changed very, very quickly. Uh, in the um, in the last years, where we see that the uh, the governments uh, really feel the, the need to 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 provide these basic services. So in this case, we 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 do our our, our job, but we introduce um, no harm analysis. Uh, we uh, have more um, uh, a process where we we include. Uh, the participation of the population, and we also try to uh, follow more closely the impact of the project uh, using, um, I would say, um, large-scale uh, impact um, evaluation using uh, Kobo toolbox tools uh, and, and so on. So something we, we try to, um, to do uh, more systematically. Uh, the second approach is to have, uh, I would say, uh, territorial approach with more integrated uh, programs. Um, so in this case, you, 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 you target a zone, and uh, which is, uh, I would say, uh, uh, an area where you see uh, vulnerabilities based on your early warning system and, and other uh, analysis. And then you say, it's here we have to work uh, with the government. Sometimes we decide in, in some cases to work with directly with uh, NGOs, which is something very new, also based on, our, based on the assumption that we have to, to go quickly. And sometimes the, the, uh, this type of uh, uh, actors are uh, better uh, armed, uh, mainly when you have to go uh, with uh, cross sectorial issues or uh, cross border issues. And then we try to provide different type of services uh, uh, on uh, on this uh, area. So this approach is really based on what we uh, learned from uh, Sahel um, uh, experience, uh, and and it's uh, uh, very key. And in this case, we are we also need to be very, um, very active on the on the governance side, and to check that uh, we we also uh, work on the justice aspects, uh, governance, and 
sometimes I would say security, which is uh, quite a, a tricky, tricky question for development uh, actors like us, how we can go to, I would say, not, um, yeah, security uh, to, to some aspect of, of security uh, when, uh, when it's needed. So I will, um, uh, I will stop here and happy to, to, to address uh, specific uh, examples if needed, but just to see how the, uh, to, to give you a, a piece of uh, our methodology in this regard. Thanks a lot, Mathieu, um, for this uh, more um, deeper uh, explanation of the approach. Um, my last question will be for, um, for you, uh, probably, Madam Vice President, because we have uh, five minutes left. Um, there's a lot of crisis going on in uh, every uh, region of the world. Uh, unfortunately, the last one and uh, most of the one of the most serious one in Europe, but there's a lot of crisis happening too in, in, in the Gulf of Guinea area. Um, how does the ECOWAS uh, uh, do the, the prioritization between uh, uh, addressing all these crises at the one time? Do you have like a, a way to prioritize in conflict prevention or do you work on, on this difficult agenda nowadays? Well, you have to balance both. We are keeping a, a eye on the ball on terrorism and violent extremism, because that is something that is still um, one of the greatest um, threats. We're seeing less of a threat now on maritime security uh, because the countries are collaborating so well. And as you know, we have this regional center in Cameroon. Uh, there's less if you look at all the reports, but our biggest problem now is governance and the elephant in the room, the three military coup d'etats in in the three countries and trying to see how we can prevent that sickness or pandemic of coups in moving to other member states. We have started speaking inwardly amongst ourselves at you know at the member states level, at the expert level, at the mediation and security council level in which we're really looking at governance issues. As you're aware, <clears throat> as a result of the military coup, we have now been asked to revise the ECOWAS protocol on democracy and good governance of 2001, because in looking at that, you know, we're sharpening our sanctions uh, provisions in that. We're also looking at term limits, which could also be a cause of um, the unease that we're also seeing and greater socio-political and socio-economic challenges. One of the early warning predictions I'm going to be looking at is the effect of the Ukraine-Russia war on commodities. The price of fuel is going up, and when that goes up, you know, the importation of goods goes up, and you know, when rice as a commodity goes up, then there's unemployment, and then as you begin to prepare for elections next year, there's trouble. So I'm looking at that very closely as a potential early warning signal for as we prepare for almost three or four elections in 2023 and 2024. Thanks a lot for this answer, very honest answer regarding all the challenging uh, facing the area of Gogo Guinea. And thanks a lot, uh, uh, our time is up. We just have one minute left. And I just saw one question was coming in, but sorry, we could not address it at this time. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Vice President. Uh, for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Nicole Munger, too, from the Auswatic Assent, and thanks a lot, Mathieu Disco, our regional uh, director in Gulf of Guinea. And thanks a lot for watching us today uh, for this uh, uh, one hour on uh, prevention in the Gulf of Guinea. Have a good uh, Fragility Week.